you know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Ferry Podcast, where I will sit down and converse with the superstars, the overachievers, the masters of our craft. Each episode will be a deep dive into their personal philosophies, their habits, the tools they use, and the secrets to not only their success, but overcoming failure as well. First, find somebody you can mimic, then find somebody you can stand, and then try to focus on one style until you master that style. So if you say, I can't do something, well, you're absolutely right. But if you say you're going to, you're absolutely right with that too. People say that you shouldn't define yourself by your work. That is not true. You know what Dave Farley does when he's, you know, lucky enough to be at the World Equestrian Games? I'm watching other people work. Yeah. I don't think uh, we do that enough. This podcast is for all of you out there who share my passion for the job and the desire to always improve. These interviews will put you in touch with the inner workings of the role models we all want to emulate. So let's get to it. You know, there's only so many hours in a day, and it's a matter of what you do with them. Welcome, everyone. If it seems like it's been a while, you're right. Fear not, though. I've been busy sending mics all over the world, and I'm excited for the guests we will have on in the coming months. A little shopkeeping before we start. You will notice that some of the questions in the Stratum Tectorium portion have been added and some have been omitted. Some I found were becoming redundant. The answers were always the same. Or they weren't really offering that much insight into the personality of the guests. And then there were others that I thought would be interesting to add. It will become apparent that some of the guests are either listeners to the podcast or did their homework before the interview and have answers prepared that actually happened in this instance and we just added those in i apologize if i omitted any of your favorites my friend ali carpenter's canadian mail-in shoeboard contest is almost finished its first round but it's not too late to enter the second one feel free to reach out to her on facebook that's a l i carpenter as in the folks that work with wood It's a great opportunity to get your journey to becoming a certified farrier started. Finally, I wanted to direct you to my friend and former podcast guest, Daniel Bennett's Lockdown Farrier Learning Podcast. Since the pandemic caused the world to come to a screeching halt, no one has done more to keep the continuing education of farriers going. Daniel has used as many platforms as possible to do this. His Facebook page has had several videos on tips for the diploma exams in the UK, and his podcast has had several great episodes with lots of practical advice and many useful takeaways. At this time, with many of us missing the traditional conventions, summits, and clinics, the Lockdown Farrier Learning Podcast is a great way to get your educational fix. Today I'm speaking with Peter Arento, CJF. Peter is a farrier whose practice is predominantly west of mine in southern Ontario. We don't cross paths nearly enough, but we always have great conversations when we do. Peter lives close to the Ontario Veterinary College at the University of Guelph and has been the resident farrier in their large animal clinic for many years. You may hear me refer to it in the conversation as OVC or the University. As you will hear... Peter is always thinking, observing, and striving to do better in this craft. All good attributes to have in his role at the university. We hadn't seen each other in quite a while, so it was great to have the opportunity to have this conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I've actually been really excited to to have this conversation because we've never actually talked about how you got started. So I thought we'd start there. And then I remember you gave a talk quite a few years ago for the OFA just on what you do at the vet hospital. And you gave like the pros and cons and some of the cases and stuff. So I thought we could touch on some of that stuff yeah, perfect. a bit too. So what made you become a farrier? So my dad used to shoe when we were little kids. And he unfortunately never started until he had three kids. 
So he was never kind of willing to give up his regular steady paycheck to go and pursue that. Okay. So anyway, one day I had a job, I was working for the government and I uh, hated it. Like I just hated going to work. And so I was complaining to dad one day and I said, like, I got to find something else to do. And he said, oh, why don't you go shoe horses? And I think I might have actually laughed at him because I said, like, man, nah, nobody does that for a living. You're crazy. <laughs> and then my dad's pretty smart. So he uh, he waited till I came home at Christmas or something. And he called a buddy of his who was still shoeing and said, oh, can you just call my son and ask him to come out with you for the day? So I went out for the day and, you know, got horses out and ran the broom. And it was a super fun day. And I thought, like, man, this could be a pretty good deal. So the fellow I went out with had suggested I go to Seneca College and I called and there was a session starting in a month. So I jumped on, I quit my job, went off to that. And it was quite lucky because as it turned out, that was the last course that Seneca ever ran. Okay. Yeah. I've heard of Seneca, but it was gone before I started. You just call me old. I like it. No, not at all. I guess in a <laughs> shorthand way I did. Sorry. No problem. So who was teaching at that point? Uh, Mel Livingston was the, okay. whatever, the head instructor. And then I think there was uh, Dave York, uh, Mark McGreevy, and Wes Goff were the, like, they came in one afternoon a week. Okay. And then when you left there, did you just hit the ground running or did you apprentice with somebody? Yeah, I, I got really, really lucky. And I ended up apprenticing with Terry Osborne up in Ottawa. Oh, okay. Yeah, which was... a. Uh, like a huge fine for me because I, in all honesty, I, I think if I hadn't had that, I wouldn't have been chewing today just because oh. it was such a good start. No kidding. You know, I was out in the weeds. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And I thought I was going to come out of shoeing school and like, they were just going to line up for me and uh, <laughs> still waiting for that line, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I, I did actually work with another guy for, I don't know, like maybe five or 10 days. And like, by the time I got done with him, you could yell at me for getting in out of the truck or for standing still or moving. Like I got yelled at so much. I didn't even, didn't even respond to it anymore. And it was just, it was horrific. <laughs> and so as luck would have it, I ended up meeting Terry at the OFA convention. Oh, okay. Someone said something to Terry and I, I said, oh, are you Terry Osborne? And I ran over to him. And then as it turned out, someone else had asked him like 10 minutes after me, to take him on and he said oh like i just just had someone to agree to so sorry so i got really lucky no kidding so you picked up and moved did you live here originally in this neighborhood or oh uh, yeah so i'm in fergus now i grew up actually i grew up probably five miles from here where i'm living now but i went off to university and then my girlfriend who's my wife now got a job in ottawa so i moved off to ottawa oh perfect went from there how long did you work with Terry? About a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. And then you somehow managed to get back to the old neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we ended up moving back, I think it was in 2000. So ultimately this is where I wanted to be closer to, closer to family and closer to friends. So we decided it was time to go. And it was at the same time that my wife got into pharmacy school. So she headed off to Newfoundland. And so we had considered moving from Ottawa to Newfoundland. And she said, like, yeah, I, I would like you to come to Newfoundland. And I said, okay, but if we go, I don't want to move again. So if we go to Newfoundland, we're staying there. And she yeah. said, well, I don't want to stay there because I don't want to have children in a place that they have to leave to find work. So ultimately, I moved up to Fergus. And then she went off to Newfoundland. And then she came back to Fergus after that. Okay. So you just worked at establishing your business and going from there. Yeah. Okay. And then when did you start working for the university? So I moved back here in 2000 and it was shortly after that, probably like 2002, 2003. Okay. Which was just good luck because uh, Bob Ward was doing it before me and he, well, he was having some health issues and I think he was getting a little tired of the politics and all that sort of business. and. He was looking to move on. I had kind of just nicely moved back and uh, right place, right time. Oh, perfect. Yeah. For the guests who wouldn't know, you work for the vet college. It's the emergency hospital, basically. It's a fairly big establishment in Ontario. It's one of, is it three vet schools in Canada, I think? 
Well, actually, that's not true. There's four because there's one in Quebec, but it's uh, French language. So, oh, okay. It does limit people that can enter there. Right. Yeah. So you must work on some pretty interesting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually some really cool stuff that kind of comes through there. In all honesty, most of it is just the horses come in and they just kind of need a decent shoeing job, right? Like I get a lot of credit for keeping horses sound there, but a lot of it isn't really deserved, right? Because let's say you're shoeing a horse and you've got a horse that's showing and he's doing eight classes a weekend and, you know, he's also doing lessons through the week. So whatever, he comes up with whatever the lameness is. Well, then the farm vet typically comes out and then they can't figure it out. So then they refer it into the university and then the university gets it. And then they quite typically put the horse on stall rest. So yeah, I shod the horse just before it went on stall rest. <laughs> well, he yeah. probably would have been just fine if you had shot him just before stall rest too, right? Just their expectations have lowered so much in that time. So, right. But yeah, there is some really interesting stuff. I bet. Now you also have access. They have quite a bit of diagnostic equipment <laughs> there. They do. <laughs> so what are some of the things that they use there that you have access to? Typically, you know, they go with the standard ultrasound and x-ray, but then they also have, um, you know, an MRI. So there is actually another local vet that has uh, an MRI at the clinic, but I think those are the only two that are relatively local. And then, you know, they have all the, all the other toys that you could ask for, really, whether it's scintigraphy, you name it, they have it. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure sometimes that also helps you look like the hero too, right? Just having yeah. that extra bit of information that yeah. they potentially have been trying to figure out for a while that a vet's not going to be carrying an MRI around. And that's the thing, you know, like I'm really good at seeing something on an MRI right after the radiologist points at it. <laughs> right. But if you had me look at an MRI, I, mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, you, oh yeah. That looks like a big blobby thing that looks a little different than the last blobby thing you look at. Whereas, you know, they have an actual radiologist who goes through, like even, you know, the vets don't read the MRIs, the radiologist does, and then they send a report to the vet. And then they quite often within that report are the images. And usually the vet can point to me and say, oh, look at this. And well, yeah, after you tell me, I, I'm pretty good at seeing it. But ahead of time, I'm not so bad with x-rays, but MRIs, you see so few of them that, you can tell like, you know, if a, an image is not symmetrical, but I don't know if it's supposed to be or what an acceptable tolerances are, but right. Radiologists know quite well. So, yeah. Yeah. I've read some of those reports. It's pretty incredible. The stuff they'll pick up. Yeah. And stuff might not even be related, but yeah, obviously the horse has had some, some injury to another spot in the past or yeah. whatever. It's pretty incredible. Well, the other thing too that I think is important for them to see is like what normal is, right? Yeah. Or, or even what's acceptable because if you MRI a 20 year old horse, you're going to find a bunch of stuff, whether that's relevant or not to yeah. the daily life. I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. I guess what would be some of the most common injuries that you run into? Or is there such a thing as a common injury? Is it all over the map? It seems to really go in cycles like, I would say a couple of years ago, I bet you there was maybe eight or 10 street nail cases in a, like a six month window. And then I probably haven't seen one since, right? So I get a horse that stepped on a nail and whatever, it's gotten infected or whatever's happened. And then, you know, for a while I had a whole bunch of suspensory stuff. So kind of, kind of the consistent ones are more, you know, laminitis, which you know, those are quite often at the university tied to colics, right? Because they have quite a few colics that come in for surgery. So then a number of them right. are just more prone to about a laminitis. But yeah, you get into all kinds of stuff, you know, like I had a horse once that uh, had gotten his foot somehow wrapped around one of those high tensile wires and just started yanking. And he, he basically skinned himself from just below his knee down to his fetlock. And it severed a bunch of the oh. holes, and yeah, it, some of, some of the stuff is pretty horrific. And usually, by the time I see it, it's, it's you know been cleaned up. And but then you get you know stuff like horses come scrambling off a trailer and you know catch the ball with their heel on 
a sharp edge or that kind of stuff. So anything, it, I mean, there's lots of traumatic stuff. And they do do, you know, some of the lameness workups where, you know, the farm vet usually just wants more information, right? So if they're going to refer in for an MRI, well, then that usually starts off with a regular lameness evaluation, right? Right from doing flexion tests to blocking feet and all that sort of stuff. Right. Okay. Well, you touched on the laminitis, but what is your approach? There are so many different approaches to laminitis. What What's your, I mean, in the acute phase and then when it comes to the chronic phase, what do you tend to do? So I, I generally, I would say the bulk of, of the founders that I deal with are not sinkers. They rotate. So I try and drop the heels and get them to bear more weight on the back of their, the back half of their foot and then try and alleviate the front half of the foot, especially in the acute phase. And a lot of that depends on whatever vet has that case, their approach. So some of them like to have, say, a reverse bar shoe with a pour-in pad. Some like to have a W shoe. Some like to have a heart bar. But ultimately, I'm trying to transfer weight to the back half of the foot uh, and keep pressure off the front half of the foot. Right in the acute phase and then you know as they grow you mean once you have a horse that's foundered you typically have they tend to grow a lot more heel and a lot less toe so effectively you're doing the same thing right trying to lower their heel and keep away from their toe as much as you can from the palmar surface yeah and try and get back from the dorsal surface and you're trying to basically transition them back into a regular open heel shoe or do you keep them in a bar shoe uh so typically at the university I'll do them and then they eventually they go back home. So right. Yeah. I will sometimes have if especially if and I'm not sure if it's the owner's not comfortable or the shoer is not comfortable, but they'll come back in and then I try and transition them to the point that I don't deal with them anymore, right? Because depending where they come from, that so the university service is a large geographic yeah. area. So I, right. I I don't want to be dragging all over the countryside <laughs> to go and chase these horses around and same for them, right? If they're shipping in, and then yeah. the, the real problem becomes if they sent, if they go home and that horse steps on a shoe or does something silly, well, then that kind of puts them in a pickle because, like, the reason they're coming down to see me is because their local guy is not that confident to do it. Right. And now he's into a panic situation that I created. So right, it is a bit unfortunate that way, but, but I do – I always try and get rid of them and send them back to their home, home shoer. Okay. Do you have a lot of conversations with home shoers, like basically to kind of explain what it is you did or, or does the follow up happen? It depends. Like I'm, I'm more than willing to, and I, I have occasionally had the home shoer come and whatever, if they want to do it while I watch, I'm okay with that. If they want to watch while I do it or any kind of combination in the middle, I'm okay with both of those. So I've had them come. I've had lots of guys want to converse, you know, we'll have, we'll exchange photos and, you know, we'll take measurements and kind of do what we can. And then you also have people who like won't return your phone calls and <laughs> they're just not interested. Yeah. So, and right. ultimately I, I, I feel that they're, you know, they probably be on their skill level and are just a bit too embarrassed to say anything about it. Yeah. But I, I can't do much about that. So no, I usually try and reciprocate whatever they send out. Uh, and, and the other time, you know, the other thing too is you, is, I mean, there's think about how many capable horseshoers there are. So quite often they probably could have done what I did, you know, if they had the tools that I had, which include getting the feet blocked and getting the horse tranked and which yeah. it, again, gives me well, not an unfair advantage, but an advantage you're not necessarily going to get at the farm and certainly not with that amount of readiness right like if i'm there and you know it's taking me longer than it should and i want to have more trank there's always yeah. three interns and you know there's lots of people there like it's not call and wait for a vet or geez let's just try and get through this as quick as we can because it you know the vet's an hour away and we've got 10 minutes more of trank so yeah now i'm not trying to get all your trade secrets out of you, but for something like a suspensory case, I know there've been almost two opposing approaches 
<laughs> that have been presented to us now. Like you, you can put an egg bar shoe on it and raise it or, or well, not raise it, but like to create that flotation effect, or you can put thinned out narrow heels and a, a much broader toe. So what approach do you take? Or does that depend on the vet again, that's the attending vet? So it, it does quite often depend on the vet. And, you know, like vets are just like us in terms of, you can tell who the speaker was at the AEP, right? Because all of a sudden, all the vets want whatever, this particular procedure or this type of right. shoeing, same as, you know, when we go to a convention or we go to a clinic and they talk about the heart bar. Well, holy man, all of a sudden you got a thousand horses that need heart bars. They didn't need them last week. And, and so the vets <laughs> yep. have the same. And the university is a bit unique in that um, they have a new crop of residents and interns pretty regularly. So it's actually quite neat to watch because, you know, to, to get that position, they have to be quite high achieving in vet school. And it's a very competitive internship to get into. So they, they, <laughs> they'll come and they'll have like a stack of 50 pages that they've printed off the internet and or like they went to this clinic and they've got handwritten notes. So if, if you look at suspensory as an example, it depends on what they were taught or what the latest research is. So yeah, I personally have had far more luck with adding more length behind than I've had with more flotation in front. Certainly in the acute situation, which is most of what I get at the university. Uh, and that being said, I do have some of my own regular clients that I have, you know, the big fat toe on and thinned out the branches of the heels and those horses make out great with that. So yeah, it really depends, doesn't it? Yeah. And and that's the worst of it, right? Like why is it in horseshoeing that you try one thing and it doesn't work? So you do the exact opposite because you're just frustrated and you have nothing and it, geez, it works. And you, you know, I can't explain why, but ultimately it doesn't matter because yeah. if that's what fixes that horse. Then that's the way to go. But it is pretty hard to explain to a yeah. client like, okay, For you sure. know the thing I told you the first time? We're actually going to do the exact opposite of that now. <laughs> Usually at that point, yeah. they've either fired you or they're so frustrated they're willing to try anything. So, <laughs> Yeah, hopefully it's plan B. Yeah. Basically at your talk a while ago at the OFA, you sort of gave a discussion almost like you were talking to somebody who wanted to maybe start working for a university or like that hospital situation. So what were some of the pros and some of the cons of, of working for them? So I would say if you look at the university, like it is one of my favorite accounts. If a business guy looked at my account at the university, they would say, get rid of it because the things I love right. about it is I love a good project horse, right? You get to see all kinds of weird things. You get to make shoes like I, I've probably made and fit, I don't know, maybe a dozen patent bars in my career so far. Whereas I, I would imagine that most people do one or two. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you get to try different things. And it's a bit of a bit of a neat experience in that you show up and you don't know what you're getting, which the downside to that is you get there and it's Friday afternoon at three o'clock and they say, yeah, we just want you to, you know, trim the heels off the left hind of this horse. And like nine o'clock at night, you're building like your six pair of bar shoes for it because things that they've done <laughs> or you show up there and you book the day and geez, you, you knock two inches of heel off and the horse walks away sound and like you're out of there in 40 minutes. Book the day, All right? Which, whatever that that's that's just part of it. And I used to find it kind of frustrating because it's all last minute. But that's how they operate, right? They they can't book you three days in advance for a horse they haven't seen yet, right? Yeah, that's just how that whole place operates, and that's how it has to operate. And so then I have the choice of I can either fit into that or I can move along, because you know if they're standing there and they've got whatever, an emergency situation, I can't say, well, yeah, I'll get there. Yeah, how's the middle of next week? So I have to make accommodations for that. Yeah, I love the account in that it was all kinds of enthusiastic people. It's the latest technology if you want to use it. And the fact that you get to see stuff that's been 
through even a farm vet. So the stuff that gets sent there. So let's say that a shoer is going to do see see five of those cases in his career. Well, a vet's maybe going to see twenty of those or fifty of those in his career, his or her career. But then, like five hundred of those get referred to the university, right? So it all kind of accumulates, and you get to see a lot of cool stuff. Mm. And every now and again, I mean, you get to see something that a uh, surgeon kind of like, what the heck is that? And like, that's a pretty cool feeling. <laughs> Right. Or you're in trimming a foot as they're doing surgery on it, you know, or, or, you know, I've, I've shot a pig, I've shot a cow. You just get to see stuff that you wouldn't see on um, as a, you know, a regular out and about horseshoe. For sure. And how do you plan for that? Like, how do you accommodate them when you do have a day and then there's an emergency call to the, the college? Like, is there a time frame you have to meet or? Like they don't say you have to be here within this amount of time. So I'm not a great communicator. So I'm not good at answering my phone. Um, but usually if the university calls, I'll give that priority. And then you can talk to them and they can say, because there are some things that say, oh yeah, like, you know, we're going to do surgery tomorrow, but we want the horse to convalesce for a week. So can you come sometime next week? Right. And then there's other things that like, yep. Like, can you get here today? So I'm very fortunate in that. So my kids are all relatively young, but my parents live five minutes away and are retired. So like, there's been more than one occasion that, you know, I've been headed for home and get a call and, you know, jump on the phone and mom or dad will go pick the kids up. That helps a lot. Right. Yeah. But, and for you sure. do get, I mean, there is... <laughs> There was one Friday night that I got a call at like, you know, it was five, five o'clock or five 30. And they said like, Oh my God, can you get here tonight? Like it's an emergency. And I said, yeah, like I'll be there in 45 minutes. Like I'll get my mom to come over and babysit. My wife was at work. So I should be there in 45 minutes. And they said, Oh, you know, like tonight's not actually not so good because the fellow that owns the horse wants to be here and he has dinner plans. And I put it like, <laughs> Okay, I'll come on Monday. He said, but it's an emergency. I said, well, then I'll be there in 45 minutes. But he's got dinner plans. So then I'll come on Monday. He said, well, can't you come on the weekend? I said, well, I, I could. But if it's such an emergency that he can't, or it's not a big enough emergency for him to change his dinner plans, she'll live on Monday. Yeah. And I, <laughs> it was, of course, a resident, right? Because it's, it's 5.30 on a Friday night. And they're like, right. like I'm yeah. here all weekend. Like, what the heck are you talking about? And I was like, sorry, <laughs> I, got, I can go on Monday. And ironically, I got there Monday, and it was a it was a former client of mine who had fired me for not showing up when he wanted. <laughs> so, <laughs> Some things never change. <laughs> so, how often would you be at the university in a week? I I'm sure it varies, but. Yeah, it, it's funny that way. Like I, I literally will not go in for. So I there I do do some of the school horses that live there, but they live in a separate barn, or okay. it's two groups and live in different barns. But you know, I won't go into the actual vet clinic, and sometimes it'll be for months. And like you think, man, did I get fired? Like I haven't. Heard of someone. And then sure enough, <laughs> you get a call, and then invariably, you know, you're in there to do one horse. And then you'll be working away and like one of the vets will walk by and they'll like, oh man, I should get you to look at the horse in 406. Now, oh, oh, okay. We'll go look. Oh, can you come back tomorrow for that? And you do that. And then someone else, oh, you know, we should have you look at this horse. And so like, I won't be in there for months and then I'll be in there, you know, six times in a week. And then <laughs> I might not be in there for a month or six months. And, and it tends to be, you know, you get in the spring during foaling season, I mean, they get quite, and when the, whatever, the money fell out of the racehorse game here, like I went from doing probably 30 foals a year to doing one or two, which I, I actually would love to be able to track the whole population of them and see like how many of those 30 would have been fine if we had left them be, how many of them would have right. yeah. up and or, but I don't know how you would ever manage to do that. Yeah. And then you get, you know, in the spring, you get a bunch of colics and, and usually kind of in the fall, 
So kind of just before the Royal, you get a big burst because these people have been pushing their, their show horses and they're trying to get to the, get to the Royal or head off to Florida. And, you know, the, the poor horse has been just limping along and finally something's happened to kind of push them over the edge. And so there seems to be a big burst of lameness cases all around the same time, just before the Royal. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, you get a lot more laminitic stuff when there's a big change in the weather and you get a few more colics. So there, there is kind of a season to it, but I don't know. I sure would hate to have to try and predict it because you're invariably wrong. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense about the seasons. I, I kind of wondered that. I, I mean, in a regular yeah. practice, I'm sure yeah. you experience yeah. that too, right? As they do certain shows, you know, you're going to come up with certain lamenesses and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Now, what does your day-to-day practice look like and consist of? Uh, so I'm doing, I'm, I'm actually, I'm trying to cut down to three days a week for the winter. I have yet to pull that off, but I've managed okay. a couple 40 weeks here and there, but I have help with me three days a week. And then I'm trying to do lighter days on the days I'm on my own, which sometimes those are great. Cause you know, you get the one horse stop that it's not really worth it to have two of you go or, you know, one that's too far away or, right. or one where, you know, you happen to really like the owner, you end up chatting for an hour and a half about whatever. And like the, <laughs> your helpers are like, man, I'd rather be home, you know, doing whatever. And you feel guilty yeah, having them right. there. So, but yeah, so most of my stuff is probably within an hour of home. It's mostly mostly English horses. I do a, a handful of Western horses. I would say probably mostly show horses, but school horses and backyarders, like kind of a mix of everything. Right. And quite a radius then, if within an hour, right? Yeah. Well, especially like in southern Ontario, there's so many horses. Like I'm I'm always shocked. And yeah. Like in Fergus, Fergus seems to be a real hotbed. There are so many horseshoes that live in Fergus. No kidding. I don't know why. Yep. <laughs> like I met a guy a few years ago. He lived like less than five minutes away from me. He'd been shoeing for 20 years and I'd never heard his name. I think he was a standard bred guy, but like, it's not that big of a world. And oh, yeah, he yeah. Five minutes away, and I'd never even heard of him and he'd never heard of me. <laughs> so, yeah, Fergus is a real hotbed of, of horseshoes, which is great. Yeah, off the top of my head, I can think of probably six of you that are in that neighborhood. Oh, yeah, I, I, I counted up. So basically, I used like houses that would service be serviced by our local high school. Okay. And I, I think I stopped at around a dozen. Oh, and wow. Those ones okay. that, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. So, no kidding. which is, is great. You're looking for help too, though, right? Like if, if, you, if you got a question, like there's someone within 10 minutes of you that can give you a hand and, right. you know, has maybe seen horse before or whatever seen that situation before yep for sure so yeah what do you do now i pretty much know the answer to this because i've run into you at many of the clinics but what are some of the clinics or ways that you keep up with the latest research or is that done do you have access to stuff because of working for the vet hospital how does that work uh i, I can get stuff so I don't actually have access to it, but I have access to people who have access to it. Right. And in all honesty, a lot of the, so, and again, it's usually a lot of the residents and interns, right? Cause they're like, they are just gung ho and, and ready to go. Yeah. Super keen. Yep. In all honesty, like I, I can maybe read the abstract of the paper, right? Cause it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's just so detailed and so focused yep. and like, I, I got to take it home with me and I got to read it three or four times before I, yeah. Uh, kind of get the gist of it yeah and that being said you can find a lot of that stuff on the internet too i personally i would say i get most of my information well now through the pandemic certainly over over the internet you know whether that's um you know like they're doing the the virtual summit as we speak or whatever youtube or different sources on the internet but my preference is certainly to go to clinics um, I find it, it's much more invigorating and, and it's a social event too, right? You get to, you get to hang around a little bit and in all honesty, the same as I'm sure most people experience this, you probably learn more sitting around telling lies and, you know, someone yep. says, Oh, like, 
some of the stuff you do have to filter out because it is lies, but that's probably <laughs> where the most of your stuff is the clinic. Yeah. Is the after stuff, you know, and I would agree. One thing that I, I happened early on, we went to, I was at an OFA convention and, you know, some, somebody asked a question It doesn't even matter what it is, but something about like, you know, how would you, I don't know, say make a square toe. And it was, it was someone who was relatively young at it. And an older guy kind of put him in his place and said, Oh, like, if you don't know that, there's no sense me telling you that, that whole routine. Yep. Then sure enough, like three hours later, it, it was actually Terry Osborne had his truck parked over in the corner under a floodlight. And he took this kid out and they were out there making square toe shoes. Right. And yeah, you know, so that, that poor kid, like he had kind of got his knuckles wrapped or got embarrassed or whatever it was. And then the actual good guys are going to come along and you not try and embarrass you. Right. They're going to try and help you and, yeah. and whatever, show you what they know. Cause you know, like you had said something about giving up trade secrets. I, I, I don't <laughs> think there are any trade secrets. And if they are, I sure don't have yeah. them. Yeah. So, well, yeah. And a lot of people I've spoken to have said that that has definitely changed over the years. Yeah. When, when I first started, <laughs> I went into a barn and there was a guy and he literally had three feet shot on a horse and he put the horse away. And like, I just wondered, I, I didn't know color of the grass. I was so, like, I was just so lost. <laughs> I went in and just go introduce myself to this guy and he packed this packed his horse away got his truck and he left really i thought like what in the heck like, I, i'd heard these stories and i thought it never happened yeah and i thought holy man like is, is he intimidated by me because i don't know nothing <laughs> or do you think that i could just by seeing him i don't know seeing his finished job that i'd be able to steal some secret from him and right I, I don't know I, I didn't learn much that day but <laughs> well and unfortunately neither did he but I think working for somebody like Terry, that probably would have instilled in you that same attitude that he has, where he was willing to share, right? Oh, for sure. And and I think the fact that he didn't have to be arrogant, he was good, right? Yeah. And so, like, he's one of the most humble guys that you you know anyone can come up and talk to him, and he's he's not going to snap your head off. He's just going to talk to you. Yep. And that's it. Yep. I've run into a lot of farriers who've worked for him or yeah. And some not even for a long time, but yeah. he's always been willing to help and yeah. teach them a few things. I remember when I started, you know, as a wide eyed young guy and you go to these things and I, I kind of remember thinking, man, I don't know why these older shoers are so grumpy. Like, you know, they'll, they'll talk to you, but they, they don't really offer up much and whatever. Fast forward 20 years. And I remember thinking, man, I can't believe those guys were so friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I, I just wasn't approaching them the right way, right? Like, I don't know what I was doing wrong, but it was <laughs> certainly in my approach, not not in their reception. Right. Yeah. Well, if you ever figure that out, let me know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, will do. <laughs> now, you were one of my inspirations for getting my CJF because... I had saw, saw those three letters behind your name. And then when yeah. I learned about the process, I went through it myself. Now, what inspired you to do it? And what do you think you benefited? So whatever, Terry had his as well, which was a, you know, he was a big inspiration for me. And then I had always thought in my heart that, you know, if I'm going to take on help, I owe it to that help to be, a journeyman because and not that you don't necessarily have the wisdom or whatever but then it's a measurable thing that i can hopefully have a better skill level than someone without it and you know all that being said just because you've got your journeyman doesn't mean you're doing great work or better work because there's great guys out there that don't have it and guys and girls obviously but for me i think we should have a licensing system and so I think if you want to take someone on, you should have a higher accreditation than someone who's working. So then when I, I, <laughs> I did take on my first help, I think our second child had just been born and I didn't know, I mean, I was staying up late at night. My wife was working nights. I didn't know what I was doing. I was so tired. So I did take on help, but I thought, you know what? Like I always told myself that I would 
be a journeyman before I took help on. So then I started getting my butt in gear and then I finally got it done by the time our third child came along. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and then for the, for the benefits, like they're endless. I think a lot of it is just, you get expose yourself to a whole better group of individuals. Like I would say, you know, five or 10 years into my career, I thought I was doing pretty good. And then it was maybe at the 10 year mark that I started to get the journeyman. Well, at the say the 12 year mark, I thought I was way worse than I thought I was at the five. <laughs> yep. You just go in and like all the stuff you thought you're doing that was so cool. Everyone else is doing it a bit nicer, right? Right. <laughs> yep. But you just kind of jump into a bigger pond and then all of a sudden it, it's, you know, like it's like a whole new world again. It was actually really fun, right? Because then you had something more to aspire to or to, to head towards and you didn't mind jumping into the shop at three o'clock in the morning because you know, you're trying to get that, you know, bar shoe made or, or whatever it was. But. Yeah. No, it, you really do start to see, especially in the process when, first of all, you're working with other people typically that are trying to do the same thing. And, um, yeah. even at the actual exam and everybody's trying to help each other out, but you see all these levels that you could achieve after that. Yeah. That's that, that Dunning Kruger effect in yeah. its entirety right there yeah yeah and then i think too it's just something you, you reach that level and then you your eyes become trained to see that you aren't as perfect as you thought oh yeah you see more of your mistakes than yeah. you ever did well, and that's the thing ideally you know as you kind of move along in your career your mistakes get tighter and tighter right so instead of Oh geez, like I trimmed him so hard he's bleeding. You're down to whatever I, you know. I'd like would like my second nail to be a little higher, yeah. or whatever whatever you're working on at the time. Yeah, but I think that's the great part of this career, right? Because if you had it all sorted out in the first six months, like could you imagine just doing that for the rest of your career and it being exactly the same? No, and I think with all of the other aspects of it, like the pain that we all experience in one way shape or form and sometimes the clientele sometimes the horses i think if it was boring the rest of that would cancel out and we we would try to find something else to do but oh for sure but there's yeah. that challenge every single day to do the yeah perfect chewing job and you know you're never going to achieve it but yeah you still want to try every time the other nice thing about it is let's say it takes you an hour to shoe a horse well, my attention span is pretty short. Like I, I can manage an hour, but you know, you look at a guy building a house and like, he's doing that same project for, yeah, you know, eight months. And like, he's just like, when will this end? Whereas, you know, you shoot a horse and you get to start again and you know, it's kind of an hour at a time or whatever the, whatever your time frame is, but it's kind of rewarding that way. Cause then if you do like, let's say that we are struggling with your second nail hole, well, you can try it again an hour later on the next one. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah, for sure. That challenge keeps us all in it, I think. Yeah. And especially people who are interested in pursuing more and, and following the career even further down the rabbit hole. Yeah. So you alluded to it and I was going to ask you this question anyways, and that was about the licensing. And I, I it is a, a hot topic. If you, talk to some people or bring it up it, it can get quite contentious yeah it's definitely a fight starter but yeah what are some of the things that you think make it necessary if you look at any other profession in the world they all have a licensing body and yeah there's there's detriments to that and you know the argument is like i don't want the government kind of intruding on my career which like, yeah, I, I'm all for less governmental interference. But if, if you look at, so as an example, my wife is a pharmacist. So if someone files a complaint, it goes to the review board. And typically the response is you get some more education. So if you look at in horseshoeing, so let's say you consistently are having a problem with close nails. Well, then your licensing body should then direct you to a specialty course on how to prevent that problem. 
And I think overall, it would just improve the skill level of everyone. Mm. And that's the thing, you know, as, as farriers, we want to be treated like professionals. We want to be paid like professionals, but we don't necessarily want to act like professionals, <laughs> right? Yeah. We expect the vets, you know, every, you hear the argument, oh, like this bloody vet is just telling me what to do. Well, why shouldn't they? Like you, if, if you don't have some sort of credential to back up your skill, because, you know, that, that vet's going to come across a guy that might be the best horseshoer in the world. And he's also going to, or they're also going to come across a person who like, this is the second horse they have ever shod and they can't treat you all the same mm -hmm. and they shouldn't treat you all the same. So I think like what would have to happen is you would go along and everyone who had declared their income from shoeing would have to be grandfathered in. So I don't think you would see a, an immediate change because all those horses still have to get shod and you know, the world has to carry on. But then if you had the new crop of shoers coming up that had to go through some sort of licensing, well, you know what? 20 years from now, the standards would be better. And if you talk to anyone, the standards are, are much higher now than they were before, especially if you look in the competition world. You talk to these older guys and they say like, man, I, you know, I won the whatever, whatever buckle it was in 1980. But I, I couldn't make a shoe that would even get me into the intermediate class anymore, right? Because the whole thing has improved. So if we could do that on a broader scale as well and do all our shoeing that way, which, I mean, that begs all kinds of questions, right? In terms of who gets to say what system is right. And, and for that, you'd have to have a collection of horseshoers to, to make up a standard, which, I mean, if you look at, at the AFA, they have done that. And, you know, whether you agree with that system or not, at least they have a system in place. Yeah. I think licensing would kind of get rid of the bottom, let's say it's 10%. Well, then that has to increase the overall skill level of everyone. And then if you start the young guys, by time 20 years go by, you've at least all had the same consistent education and passed the same test. Right. You've learned to shoe to a specific standard. And then whether yeah. you continue shoeing at that or not, yeah. And, and even that, you know, there's going to be even within, so let's say everyone went to the same school, you're not all going to shoe the same, No, but if you look at vets or physicians, they all went through med school or vet school, but they're not all, you know, and some of them are better at lameness and some of them are better at reproductive work. And even within that, if you had 10 lameness vets or, or 10 cardiac surgeons, some are better than others. But at least you know they've got the skill to to meet that minimum standard. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you for trudging out into the choppy waters yeah. on that one. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> I have some angry phone calls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll put your uh, phone number in the show notes. <laughs> have you had a moment where? you were well into your shoeing career and maybe this happened during the, when you were pursuing the certification, but where you learned something that completely changed an aspect of what you did, like it, it really changed your perception on how you looked at something specifically. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can, I can remember this vividly because I was having trouble dressing feet. I'd asked probably 10 people and they all, gave me an answer that sounded quite reasonable. It just, it just didn't work for me. And then I was at one of the clinics and it was actually another fellow that was parked beside me that was doing the practice course as well. And he showed me and it just, it clicked. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the same thing that guy said, and that guy said, and that guy said. <laughs> so I don't know if I was a bit further along in my career and I was ready to hear it finally, or if he just said it a little different way, but then like literally eight people had told me the exact same thing in a slightly different way. Yeah. And I didn't get the first eight guys. It was like, it was lost to me. And like that guy was like, Oh my God, the sun just came out. <laughs> yep. I, I had yeah. that moment with that specific thing. It, it, it was Cody. And because everybody had, like you said, a slightly different way of explaining it that sounded like I should get it, but yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing. Once I got it, 
all those and all the stuff they said made perfect yeah, sense but for sure until i got it i like what are you talking about man? That work. <laughs> all the pieces fell into place yeah yeah it, w- it was a real eye-opener and like I don't know if I felt like a genius or an idiot or both, yeah. but it was, it was a whole waft of a raft of emotions all at once. <laughs> right. Would you like to try the short answer questions then? I would love to. This portion of the podcast is called the Stratum Tectorium. These are the short answer surface stuff questions, but it's okay if the guest wants to go deeper. Enjoy. Do you have a favorite book? Uh, yeah, so I quite regularly will read a book called Sit, uh, and it's by a local author. And one of my one of my kids had brought it home from school, and I think they were celebrating local authors. And I think Deborah Ellis is the author's name, and it's a collection of maybe eight or ten short stories that it just kind of gives you a perspective on where you are in the world. Like if I'm feeling beat down and uh, life is so hard, you read this book, and it just you get to see the world through other people's eyes. Really? Yeah. It's a quick, quick read, but I quite like it. Okay. I'm going to look that one up. Favorite brand of nails. I was thinking about this today. I actually talked with Allie who was working with me and I said, you know, every one of us, well, she actually commented that everybody she's ever worked for has used a different type of nail. So I thought maybe we should be adding this. It is kind of a different one. So I can't remember the name. What are the, the new cool ones now that you can get in copper? Oh, the Liberties? Yeah. So the I don't like the copper, but the the Liberties, the Liberty E-heads are my, my favorite. Your go-to? Yeah. I use the fancy rose gold ones, the copper yeah, no, ones. I'm, I'm not, <laughs> not sold on it. <laughs> no. And here's another new one. What shoe sizes do you generally have to stock the most of? Uh, the most are probably like one, two, and three fronts, and then probably two and three hinds are probably my most regularly used. Yeah, that was something I found everybody I talked to, there was kind of a different range for each person. Yeah. Mine's pretty similar yeah. to yours. Favorite make of rasp? <laughs> so I, I have thought about this a lot. I think a 2005 Heller Legend. <laughs> Even the vintage. I'm not on the time machine, but if if I ever am driving the DeLorean around, yep, and I, I'm going to swing by the supply shop in 2005 and pick up a few cases. Marty, we got to go back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what is your dream farrier rig? So I would say probably my current rig is my current dream farrier because it's paid for. Hey, yep. yeah. So I've got a you know a six and a half foot stone well. I don't have a lot of fancy stuff in it, but it certainly has serves all my needs. Uh, it's on a three quarter ton diesel that's big enough to fit the whole family and the dog in. So I don't use it as a as a personal vehicle very much. But sometimes when you just gotta you know drive the kids to something, it's pretty handy to have the the double cab. Uh, and then I'm hoping some point in the future I'll have an electric truck. Yeah, with an electric induction forge in it. Oh, really? Yeah. I I just, I don't know how much power they take and what the battery capability is, but I'm hoping to not have to find that out for a few more years yet. (laughs) Gotcha. Well, Elon is probably working on it as we speak. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Favorite rounding hammer. I've got my favorite one. I've got an old Jim poor that I've had a few people try and nab here and there. And I, (laughs) Stick it in my back pocket if it's if I'm somewhere because yeah I've got an old gym pour that I love oh, okay. it's a pound and three quarter. pound and three quarter yeah favorite type of bar stock to work with uh, I would say seven eighths five sixteenths oh okay and would you use that a lot in like the therapeutic shoes you'd make for the university uh, I use it a lot in any of it. so I, I try and make most of my bar shoes mostly because I don't use that many and it's, it's enough that it kind of keeps me in the forge with enough regularity. Yeah. And it is, it is a pretty versatile, I mean, you get into a bigger foot, you know, I probably also carry some like three eighths by one or, or, or you get into smaller feet. You know, I've got down to probably even quarter, three quarters, but seven, eight, five sixteenths is probably my, my most versatile or the biggest range of, of 
shoes I'll make with. Okay. Favorite pastime after work? This time of year, I'd probably say hockey. I play hockey a couple times a week and I coach a few times a week. And it's a, just a great, great way to spend some time. Get some of your frustrations out. Yeah, exactly. What's the next thing on your bucket list? Uh, for shoeing or for life? It can be both. Uh, for shoeing, uh, I would love to do my therapeutic endorsement. I don't think I will be doing that until my kids are a little bit older. Cause if I'm going to, you know, I figure that's probably a few hundred hour commitment too. Yeah. So if I'm going to commit a few hundred hours right now, it's going to be to my kids. So yeah, probably in another, I don't know, five years or something, I'll probably start that. Okay. And then for my personal life, we're, we're actually just finishing up building a house right now. And we just, we just bought a farm about a year ago. Uh, so right now, playing on my farm. Nice. You're not going to own horses, are you? Do you know what those things cost to shoe? <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> ironic. I do have one horse. <laughs> and so my, my oldest daughter, so we'd only had the horse a couple weeks. And she came to me and said, Dad, I, I've been thinking about this. I think you should get Kathy to shoe your horse. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy last month lives yeah. miles from here. And I said, like, what? I said, well, no, it's, it's like a doctor. Like, you know, doctors don't work on their own kids as patients. I said, well, I bet you if they had to pay for it, they would. Like, <laughs> I said, what about the guys that work for me? Like, like what's wrong with them? <laughs> oh, just, just Kathy's a nicer person. <laughs> well, you got me there. Like, <laughs> yeah, Kathy is pretty hard to beat. I actually almost asked her, but then I thought, oh, I know she'd come and do it. So I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I know like I would ask her. But. Yeah. That's hilarious. Favorite brand of keg shoe? Uh, Kirkhart's. Kirkhart SSBs. Oh, okay. Yeah, you you draw your own clips, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. When do. necessary. Yeah. Ideal number of horses to shoe all around in one day? Uh, I would say on my own, three. Uh, with help, six or seven. Okay. Favorite anvil? Uh, I've got it. My favorite is a future two. Okay. Yep. Do you have a favorite inspirational quote? I, I do. I looked one up. I figured you would. Yep. So this is from a great Canadian, Wayne Gretzky. So he said, I skate to where the puck is going to, not to where it's been. So I, I view that as a, as a horseshoeing thing. A lot of my value, I feel as a farrier is I can prevent problems. So if I can see a problem coming, I can head it off. Then I think that's, that's where I have value over someone else. Right. And I'm sure seeing all the cases when they're, at their absolute worst kind of gives you even more insight into that, right? It does. And it certainly, you know, it makes you, when you, when you see a horse in your right, your everyday clientele, you think, holy man, like, uh, you know, cause you, you talk to the referring vet or to the, the farrier who did it at home or the owner, whoever, it's like, man, this started out as whatever, something relatively small and it just kind of got away from us. And so then, you, you know, you're thinking that in your own clientele like oh man if i don't get it this quick <laughs> yep it's gonna turn into something more yep. i'm gonna have to see it at the university <laughs> yeah exactly yeah actually, i guess i've never had that happen i've never had my own i've never had a horse from my own clientele in there i don't think huh maybe maybe i have i don't know i don't quote me on that but... <laughs> well I, you must be doing something right then well no or they all just fire me before that who knows right so this is another new question do you have a farrier terrier do you have a, a dog you bring along with you? I do. I currently have a Hungarian Vizsla or Visla. Someone's going to be really upset I didn't pronounce that right. <laughs> but yeah, she's a spectacular dog, but like just the energy level is insane. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. But she does come everywhere with me. So, okay. It is nice to have that constant company, isn't it? Even on yeah. the days when you're on your own. Well, and even that, you know, like I, I she, she's real bad. Like she'll go and, like rubber arse up against people's legs. And I think, man, if I did that, I'd be sent to jail. Like, hey, oh, look how cute your dog is. Like, what the heck? If you're stumped on a case or need backup, who's your go-to? So I would say it's actually probably Jason Fox. So I've been very fortunate. Jason's been helping me kind of one day a week for the last year or so. And so even just the other day, we went to a spot and there's a, a foot that 
I, I just can't seem to make any headway with it. It doesn't seem to be getting any better, but it doesn't be getting any worse, but I just don't like it. So I specifically took him to that spot and said like, okay, like, what do we do about this? <laughs> and so we, we, I, I don't know what the results are yet. He basically thought the same way I did, but was a little, you know, he trimmed it a little harder on one side. So I'm hoping I go back and like the foot just looks like dynamite. Right. That's cool. Yeah. I actually remember calling the one day and he was in the truck with you. Yeah. yeah. And I guess yeah. under the pressure of having you in the truck, he forgot to tell me that the horse I was asking about had never been hot shod. Yeah. He, <laughs> like, he did get a panic call back like three minutes later. He's like, holy man, I forgot to tell him that. Yeah. Because you know, he focused on whatever the, what I can't remember what the issue was, but there was some issue with the horse. Yeah. And then, well, oh, man, I should have told him not to hot or that he'd never been hot shod. But well, I didn't get the second call, and then I it showed up on my phone. And I kind of noticed it later. I called him later that night, and he's like, "Oh, you're still alive." <laughs> oh, did the horse hot you? Yeah, it was great. It was like oh, perfect. Been done for years that way. So, oh, perfect. yeah, maybe he had a calmer demeanor than Jason. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm of less uh, threatening stature. Yeah, there you go. My forearms are not nearly as big, so. Do you have a favorite shoe or package for mystery lameness when the client either doesn't want to pay for a diagnosis or the vet has has been stumped? So I, I would say if I'm kind of struggling and don't know what to do, I'm probably most likely to use a bar shoe and a pour-in pad. Yeah? Yeah, and I, I find that cures, well, Maybe masks a lot of ills too, right? I don't know. I don't know that we cure anything, but right. mask a lot of stuff, and you know, like maybe that lets him be sound enough on something that he his knee gets a bit better, and then you can see that his shoulder's really bugging him or whatever it is. Right. But yeah, that's probably my most versatile thing if I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. Cool. What do you use as your planner or agenda? Uh, my phone, just the calendar on my phone. Do you? Have high tech. Oh yeah. <laughs> your favorite method of soothing aches and pains probably stretching and doing something else whether it's you know going for a bike ride or playing hockey or even even if it's digging fence posts it's just something that's a different a different set of muscles and a different movement than than shoeing right and lots of stretching yeah is that a daily routine for you not as much as it should be so when i'm sore like i will stretch i'll get up and I'll stretch for an hour a day and then you get feel better. That time gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And then <laughs> right. you get, and all of a sudden you, Oh geez, it hurts again. So you're back to an hour again. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Probably stretch most days. Okay. Do you have a favorite drink? Ah, uh, coffee. Yeah. No question. Yeah. Yeah. Favorite genre of music. I like it all except for, you know, like the real intense heavy metal stuff. It, it kind of scares me a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, the pop music my kids listen to, like I, maybe if I only heard the song once, it'd be okay. But like the 85th time yeah. on repeat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can get sick of anything that way. Yeah. And what would you have been if not a farrier? I definitely would have been a dairy farmer. I actually, I almost bought a dairy farm when I was in my mid 20s or early 20s. Uh, and so I, my, my grandfather had found this guy that was willing to do a succession plan. And so whatever, I got a bunch of information from his accountant effectively and uh, even drove up to go see the farm. And I did a bit of like, you know, napkin math. And I figured out if I didn't spend a nickel on whatever, a vet, equipment, anything, I could maybe break even by the time I was 50. And I thought, man, like that's a long <laughs> time for now. <laughs> well, that being said, I'm almost 50 and I'm still in debt. So. <laughs> It could have been better off, but. And then I, I did actually have another one. You know, I had my big career crisis. Like, oh, this is crazy. I'm going to go do something else. I think I was quite sore or something at the time. So I went, <laughs> I went and bought one of the um, aptitude tests. And like, I sat down and I, I, I timed all the sections and like I did it as whatever fairly as I could. And so, like, you know, you get you know your code number A seven five two, and I flipped to the back of the book. And it said corporate accountant. No like, way. What? Uh, I can't do that. So I, I luckily stuck with horseshoeing because <laughs> uh, I do truly love it. Yeah. Um, there was, that was just a, 
the point of my career where I thought, you know, like it's, it's now or never, right? Like I've, I've kind of got to make a choice change if I'm going to, and I'm really, really glad I didn't make a change now. Now, what was the job that you did? The government job that you did before? Uh, at that point <laughs> I was working for agriculture Canada doing, um, seed research so it was um uh genetically modified seeds that had pest control embedded into them that was the job i had at that point oh okay so the fellow i was working for had said to me that he wanted me to to go back and get my master's and i thought well if i'm gonna get my master's i might as well get my phd but then i thought like i hate going to work now like (laughs) i can't do this for the rest of my life and off i went so ah well i'm glad you did yeah me too yeah and i guess we'll keep the last question the the covid if you were in a lockdown for a month stuck in a shop with somebody who would it be so i i think it would have to be uh duncan stewart oh cool and i we worked together for years and years and years whatever we can joke around but we have a very similar style both like kind of monkeying around with you know we we We'd probably try and make some knives or something or, or think up something really weird to try. Yeah. And I also think if I'm cooped up with someone for three months, they better be smaller than me because it's going to end in a fist fight somehow <laughs> and he's smaller. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if I'd win, but at least I'd have the size advantage. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. Playing the odds. No, that's, yeah. that's good. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Peter. This has been awesome. Yeah, no problem. It's been fun. I, 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 I got to tell you that. So when you had originally sent me the text, I had, I had said to, I think it was maybe at the dinner table, oh yeah, I just got asked to be on a podcast. My middle daughter, Natalie said, are you sure they got the wrong guy? <laughs> <laughs> or, or sure they got the right guy? I said, yeah, like, I guess. Well, maybe there's another guy named Peter. Like maybe they think you're someone else. I'm like, holy <laughs> man. <laughs> really honest. Wow. <laughs> really good for your ego. I guess time will tell. Maybe she was right. We'll, see. <laughs> well, hey, the, the invite did end up in your inbox. So I, I think I had the right guy. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> well, you have my name. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I will work on that. <laughs> I think I lost a bet. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I don't know, this was wicked fun. Before I go, I wanted to talk about an incident that happened to a friend of mine fairly recently. She was working on a horse, and one that had just been done and was put in a stall had escaped and trampled her. She woke up on the floor, bloodied and quite bruised, and not remembering much of what had happened. As you can guess, there is a fairly severe concussion involved. So this is once again a reminder to all of us that even though there are situations like this one where we could not have predicted it, there are others where we kind of know we're getting into some sketchy waters with a horse and we need to be stronger advocates for ourselves and our safety. There are many of us who have been in situations where we just didn't want to have that difficult conversation with the client. We knew that insisting on trank or better training would actually cause a rift and potentially cause us to lose the client. But situations like this show how easily things can go very wrong and one horse can cost us a lot of business, sometimes our entire business. That is not the case, fortunately, here, but it's just something that we should all be aware of. Daniel Bennett is actually covering an episode on this fairly shortly, and it would be a good one for us to listen to and just remind us of all of these things. So when I say at the end of every episode, take care of yourselves and each other out there, I actually truly mean it. And I am so thankful to be part of this brotherhood and sisterhood of farriers who, in this case, have all reached out to myself and my friend. They're all going out and willing to shoe the horses for her to keep her business going and to keep her family under their roof. So I'll say it again and hopefully 
it seems even more authentic this time, but take care of yourselves and each other out there. We'll talk soon.